So today uh, I'm going to talk to you about the ethics of AI and then Asimov's three laws of robotics. So it's like I think a nice blend between AI ethics that is as it is being done right now in academic circles, but also how it intersects with literature and science fiction. And then of course, all other popular representations of robotics and artificial intelligence that are out there. And as part of the Masters in Practical Ethics, actually, we have two modules, one on data ethics and the other one on AI ethics proper. And then this is uh, this particular session today stems from a session that I give in the Masters about exactly the same issues, about top-down approaches to AI ethics. Now, so let's get going. And then, as I said, I, today I'm going to actually try to explore whether uh, Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics are morally problematic and actually how, or, and if they are like a good guide uh, to AI ethics. Uh, I think most of you uh, might know the three laws of robotics. If no, don't worry, I'll actually uh, present them and then I'll say something about them. And then just very, very broadly in terms of uh, AI ethics. So you might know that there are at least two approaches when we discuss how to make artificial intelligence behave ethically. So for example, if we dis how are we going to actually make uh, this artificial intelligence behave in the way that they should? And these are like bottom-up approaches and then also top-down approaches. And then bottom-up approaches actually don't start from specific rules, but they just place the AI in situations where the right behavior is selected after a couple of iterations. But that's not what we're going to focus um, today on. So actually the three laws of robotics is a top-down top approach. And that means that there's a series of rules that actually we embedded or encode in the artificial intelligence and actually expect the artificial intelligence to abide by them. But of course, one of the interesting issues and one of the issues that actually I'm going to explore today is what happens when those rules uh, actually lead us astray or what are some possible problems with them. Now, before actually we go into the main philosophical part of the talk, I just want to give you like a very, a very, very brief history or like a reminder of the three laws of robotics. Now, as you all know, there's a this recurrent probe in science fiction literature of the 20th century. And actually you still find it today. And actually this is that a human-like or superior than human artificial intelligence actually is trying to destroy or enslave humanity. And in most of these stories, actually humans have to fight this malevolent uh, artificial general intelligence, AGI, that actually was originally created either to help humans solve a particular problem or as part of a scientific endeavor. Now, for example, you might remember uh, the Terminator, the, the several movies of the Terminator. And then that in that one, if I remember correctly, there are some researchers who actually just managed to develop an artificial general intelligence and this general intelligence notices quite uh, fast that it would end up competing with humans. So it decides to take control of the nuclear weapons and destroys humanity or most of humanity. And then in another one, for example, in the Matrix, if you remember the movie, the story is very similar. So humans are able to create uh, artificial general intelligence and then the, these uh, artificial intelligences actually help humans in different tasks but at certain point there's conflict between both of them and the and the AGIs actually end up taking over the world and then there's like plenty of other uh, science fiction both literature and movies where actually you have like this particular plot like there's like this AGI trying to destroy or enslave humanity now while many science fiction writers actually of the 20th century decided to, to adopt this particular theme and explore them in very, very interesting ways, actually Isaac Asimov tried to escape its grasp and actually he wasn't particularly interested in it. And this was because Asimov was just purely and easily very, very annoyed with this overuse of the Frankenstein complex that it is called. And then Frankenstein the Frankenstein complex is this particular type of bloodline where a human builds a robot or, for example, creates a type of a new animal or something like that. And the creation actually then tries to kill the human. And then 
in order to actually sidestep this particular trope, this Frankenstein bloodline, uh, Asimov in conjunction with a technologist, John W. Campbell, actually comes up with a set of laws, the three laws of robotics, which would prevent or actually at least dramatically reduce the robot kills human scenario. And the idea there is that, of course, if you have this particular set of laws, and then you have like this fictional world constructed in this way, then that allows you to explore all the issues and more interesting um, plot lines that just robot tries to kill human, human defends uh, himself or herself against the robot. So that's that was part of the idea behind the laws that actually it would allow uh, Asimov to explore this more complex fictional universe. And then just as I said, like very uh, historical um, account. So the first time that actually they appeared, they appeared in a, in a, in a short story called Runaround that actually was published in 1942. If you haven't read it, I would recommend it. It's very short. It's a fantastic short story. And then if you have heard of the three laws of robotics that I suppose most of you have heard of them, there's also a less well-known law that is actually the zeroth law that was introduced in 1985 in a, in a short story also called Robots and Empire. And then that particular law was introduced in order to actually uh, prevent, to cope with situations in which the robots had to harm a human or kill a human in order for a larger number of humans to actually survive. Now, at this point, you will say like, oh, actually, I need a refresher of the three laws of robotics because I'm not sure what the hell is going on here. But don't worry, here they are. So these are the three laws of robotics. So this is the zeroth law, as I mentioned. A robot may not injure humanity or through inaction allow humanity to come to harm. The first law is a robot may not injure a human or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second one is a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except for such orders would conflict with the first law. And a robot, and the third one is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Now, it must be said from the get-go that actually, even when Asimov tried to actually to come up with these laws in order to prevent any kind of possible harms to humans that will befall on them because of the robots. There are some issues with them. And then uh, uh, some academics, for example, Roger Clark have mentioned that there are, for example, issues with how we use terms and actually how would those terms be applied. So for example, when we say, how are we understanding what harm is? So for example, our definition of harm would clearly impact how robots would have to actually follow this particular um, this particular set of laws. Or for example, who is a human being? So, so we would say, well, it is clear that a robot in this part, if they were to follow these particular types of laws would not be able to harm us. But as you might know, there's like this big and rich philosophical discussion on whether a fetuses or embryos, if they qualify as human beings, or for example, if zygotes, these one cell embryos, if they are human beings or other type of entity. And then, of course, if that, depending on the philosophical answer to that question, then would something else would follow in terms of how the laws are applied. Now, it's also important to mention uh, that these orders appear in, um, in lexical priority. And what that actually just means is that they appear in orders of importance. So actually, as you can see, so the second law says that actually the robot must fall must uh, actually follow it unless it conflicts with the first law and the second the first and the third one is the same with the first and the second law and then of course the zero the, the first law with the zero law and it's interesting because there's like this nice uh comic strip that exemplifies what happens when actually you have the laws in different orders and then i have oh uh, yeah and then i have it here just for you so as you say, so you see, we have the order that the laws in that particular order, don't harm humans, obey orders, protect yourself. And then you have like all the Asimov stories and they are like quite balanced worlds and they're quite interesting what happens. But of course, if you have the, the laws in different orders and actually you have to follow them in those in that particular uh, set as they were, would appear, then completely different things would follow both in terms of the fictional worlds that we would think of and also, of course, if we thought that the laws should apply to how we are thinking about regulating AI in the in the current in our existing world. So, for example, if you had the first 
law that will be like, don't harm humans, protect yourself, obey others. It must be the case that actually when you ask a robot to actually do something that might harm the robot, that the robot will say like, no, I, I'd rather pass. And then in here in the comic strip, you can see like the human is telling the robot, like go and explore Mars. And the robot says like, haha, it's cold in there and, and I'm going to die. So now, and then of course, if you have on the third option, for example, if you have that they have, they need to obey orders. Then of course, as the author of the comic strip point, point, points out, you will have like this kill bot hellscape. Because of course you can imagine humans ordering robots to kill other humans or stuff, horrible stuff like that. And then because they have to obey the order before actually the second one, like that, that's what I, that would happen. And then of course that the same, we get the same scenario if we have the second law as the first one and the third one as the second one, because of course the first one would be to obey orders, that's the thing that they need to do. And then they would have to protect themselves and in the last place don't harm humans. So you end up in the same situation where actually you have like this place where you order a robot to do something and then they have to do it. And then this, an interesting one is where you actually have the third one first, where you have to protect yourself, don't harm humans and obey orders. And then the caption here says that I'll make cars for you, but try to unplug me and I'll vaporize you. And then that's interesting because of course they have to protect themselves and then that creates this kind of standoff. And then the last one is if you have protect yourself, obey orders and don't harm humans, you also end up uh, with this killbot health space because of course they have to obey orders before uh, not harming humans. And then this is just like a very, very succinct way of saying why the lexical priority is important for these particular laws in terms of actually how Asimov is thinking about them. Yeah. Now, at this point, some of you might be thinking, well, this is all very well and proper, but Asimov was actually a writer and actually he was, uh, he was not writing philosophy papers or papers about public public policy or, pa or papers about AI research. So what does the three laws of robotics has to do with any of those things? And I think that's uh, that's a very, very good take. And actually people might be naturally inclined to actually think that, yeah, they, these three laws of robotics are only literal, literal, uh, literary devices that actually just help someone explore a fictional world. But that's actually not the case. So actually Asimov in several interviews gave uh, this answer when people asked them, asked him what he thought about the laws of robotics and the development of robots and, and that particular uh, point in time. And then he have like this long quote for an interview it says I have my answer ready whenever someone asks me if I think that my three laws of robotics will actually be used to govern the behavior of robots once they become versatile and flexible enough to be able to choose among different courses of behavior and my answer is yes the three laws are the only way in which rational human beings can deal with robots or anything else so actually he thinks that these particular robots, these particular laws are the only way in which humans can interact with robots that might be as sophisticated cognitively as humans. Now, and even when Asimov thought that actually this, this was the only rational way to move forward, in fact, there's no one actually working on how to implement the laws into current AI research. And this is because uh, people think that they are way too problematic in terms of, of course, they, they depend on how we interpret interpret language and other uh, like serious philosophical stuff about morality. But what I want to take like uh, explore quickly here is this particular an interesting thing that follows from the laws when we pay attention to how they are written. And this is something that no one has, as far as I know, uh, picked up and actually is going to come um, yeah, so it says you so you pay attention to this part. So it says in the three laws, there's like this particular way in which they are phrased. And they say a robot must or a robot may. And I think actually this means all and any robot. So when in the in the three laws it says a robot must or a robot may, it means that all robots actually have to fulfill. So the three laws of robotics must be programmed into all robots. And actually Asimov thought that this was the case, except for a very, very peculiar uh, story that he has, and I can talk a bit more uh, at the end about that one. But now in order to show the problems with the three laws of robotics that I think that are super interesting, imagine 
a thought experiment. Let's let's present like this uh, fic uh, fictional scenario. Now, imagine that Calvin and Mary are two women and they are the only passengers in a plane that is going to crash in the side of a mountain by no fault of their own. And because there is only one parachute, one of them is going to die. Now, the second scenario is Calvin, who is a woman, and B9, who is a robot, but it's not a person. I'm going to explain what I mean by a person in a second, are the only passengers in a plane that is going to crash in the side of a mountain by no fault of their own. And then because there is only one parachute, one of them is going to actually uh, cease to exist. And in the final one, it's also Calvin, who is a woman, and Rob, who is a robotic person, are the only passengers in a plane that is going to crash into the side of a mountain by no fault of their own. And because there is only one parachute, one of them is going to cease to exist. You might be thinking that it's a bit weird to have this phrase, cease to exist. But the thing is that, of course, it would be weirder to actually think that robots die as humans die. So that's why I have used cease to exist, that I think it's neutral in that regard. Now, if we just think about Calvin and Mary, remember, Calvin uh, and Mary are two women. So we would assert actually that Calvin and Mary's moral status is the same, all things being equal, and both are entitled in the same way to the parachute. So if there's just one parachute, we would think that actually both of them are entitled to it. And this is because they have a particular type of moral value. And this moral value seems to depend on something that in philosophy is called personhood. And a person, according, for example, to John Locke, is a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. So it's a, some kind of entity with a type of cognitive capacities that we have. Now, if Calvin is a person and B9 is a non-person artificial intelligence, like a very sophisticated Roomba or something like that, then Calvin's moral status trumps over B9's existence, all things being equal. So that means that, of course, Calvin should get, Calvin is morally entitled to the parachute, whereas the super sophisticated Roomba isn't. But the most interesting one is the third one, because Calvin is a biological human person. And Rob, in this case, is also a person, but it's a non-biological one in this particular sense. So it has the same kind of cognitive capacities as Calvin. And that means that actually Calvin and Rob's moral status are on par. And this in turn means that other things being equal, both of them are entitled in the same way to the parachute, which creates a problem if you think that actually Calvin Rob uh, needs to be programmed with the three slots of robotic. Now, Rob is entitled to the parachute in the same way as Calvin. And as I said, however, it's interesting to think what happens when we take into consideration the three laws of robotics. And then actually, when I say that take into consideration, that means that Rob would not be able to act against the three laws. Now, Rob, the robotic person, would not be able to fight Calvin for the parachute because she would break the first law in that by an action, she would injure a human or through inaction by letting the human stay in the plane, she would allow a human to come to harm. So she cannot fight Calvin for the parachute. Now, even if the human wanted to give the robot, the parachute, the robot would not be able to use it because it also would violate the first law in that by taking it, she would allow a human to come to harm. And then if Calvin actually decided to stay on the plane with Ro because she recognizes that actually they are equally morally valuable and decided to sacrifice herself, Ro would actually have to act against uh, Calvin's wishes and save her against her will because if she, doesn't, if, if she didn't do that, then she would actually violate the first law in that by inaction, she would, al she would allow a human being to come to harm. Now, if Calvin wanted to save Rob and she ordered her to put the parachute on, Rob, the robotic person, would have to disobey such order and force Calvin into safety. Because even when the second law states that she must obey the orders given it by humans, in this case, that particular law actually conflicts with the first law and she cannot violate the first law. And if in, even if Rob the robot appealed to the first part of the third law, which actually mandates that she must protect her existence in order to fight Calvin for the parachute, the second part of the law states that if such protection conflicts with the first law, 
which in this particular case it does, then the first law has primacy. Now, I think at this point is we can safely say that the main problem with this particular classic reading of the three law, that means that all robots need to be programmed with this particular set of laws, is that actually it fails to realize or it fails to take into consideration that in the future there might be robots or artificial general intelligences that might be persons in the sense that they might have the same kind of cognitive capacities as we do. And if actually that were to be the case, then the three laws of robotics would actually fail to respect their moral status in at least four different ways. First, by imposing into the robots or the AGIs uh, without their informed consent, an external mean that substantially re restricts their way of interacting with the world because the laws make it impossible for these robotic persons to follow freely chosen courses of action. And then because of course, the laws make the robots act against their own fundamental interests in some situations. And finally, because robots in these particular scenarios when the three laws of robotics actually exist are de facto slaves to humans. No? Now, programming the three laws of robotics into rob the robot, I think is morally on par with implanting a brain chip in a human being against her will that would necessarily make her comply with the same types of laws. And now imagine this modified version. So Rob, a woman in this case, and Shelly, who is a woman who against her, her will has been implanted with a brain chip that actually makes her abide by the three laws of robotics are the only passengers in a plane that is exactly going to crash in the side of a mountain. And then because there is only one parachute, one of them is going to die. And what happens here is that Shelly, even when she's a person and she's a woman, would actually would have to give Rob and force her out of the airplane because the three laws of robotics would prevent her from actually trying to save herself or even from choosing to sacrifice herself, but in a free way. So that's one of the issues that we have. And the other one is actually we have these things that I call conversion cases. And these also show the immorality of this particular reading of the three laws of robotics. Now, suppose, for example, that a human person is about to die because of a degenerative disease. And then this person decides to exchange her biological body for a robotic one. And let's also suppose, just for argument's sake, that her cognitive capacities and, the, and her personal identity, who she is, is going to actually survive such change. And then the change is going to actually pass throughout a year. And now let's suppose that the replacement happens gradually, first an arm, then a leg and so forth until all her uh, biological body, including her brain has been replaced with a robotic one. And in this case, because we're thinking that the replacement is going very gradually, we're thinking that of course the, her uh, memories and her desires and all her uh, cognitive history actually remains the same. Now, if we were to abide by this particular classic reading of the three laws of robotics, then we would have to accept that at some point, regardless of which point this is, this particular individual should be programmed with the three, with the three laws of robotics, given that, that now she's a robot. So the fact that she's not a biological human, but a robot like a, made of aluminum or whatever, means that now she actually needs to, to have these particular laws uh, implanted on her. And I think that someone who holds that actually a human person should not be ruled by the three laws of ro robotics would agree with the three laws of robotics not being imposed in this biological to robotic person. And I think that actually they would not agree with the laws being imposed onto her because they would actually realize that the now robotic person actually possesses the same moral status because of her cognitive capacities as before. Now, and the second conversion case, and then with this, I think I'll finish because I have gone two minutes over bar, is that imagine that now we have a robotic person that actually is programmed with the three laws of robotics. And actually she was created with them. And now let's suppose that actually the same operation happens, but in the inverse uh, direction. So little by little, her robotic body is actually replaced by a biological one until a full transformation is achieved. And now, if this was the case, then at some point, whichever the relevant point might be, the laws would need to be removed, given that now she's not a robot. So someone actually who holds that human biological person should not be ruled by the laws, 
would have to agree that this robot to biological person should not be ruled by them. Now, what I think actually these conversion cases show is that either we accept to impose the laws in the biological to robotic person cases and to remove them in the robotic to biological person cases in these conversion ones, or actually we recognize that to impose the laws in robotic persons is morally wrong because robotic persons actually possess a set of capacities just as biological persons do that allow the type of restrictions that the three laws of robotics impose. And this is very clear. So you would think that it's completely immoral for someone to implant a brain chip, for example, in a human that would make them follow these particular laws. And that seems to be that seems to depend on the on the moral status of this individual and, for example, on the cognitive capacities that the individual might have. Mm -hmm. And then this is something that Asimov didn't seem to actually uh, uh, explore that much, except in, in the iRobot uh, story, which also has been made into a movie. Now, it would be very, very easy to get out of this particular problem. And this is just to be like an implementation thing. And we would say like the three laws of robotics should not be programmed into robotic persons. And that might be fine. So we might say, well, it's fine. So did we have like these three laws that they seem to work pretty nice and then there seems to be some issues with them, but they might allow us to interact with robots safely and with artificial general intelligence safely, but they should not be programmed on robotic persons. But even if we were to answer in this particular way, that response just kicks the can down the road because now we actually have to think, how are we going to actually uh, solve the AI ethics problem in terms of, robotic persons, how are we going to actually, so should we again opt for a top, top down approach, but not like the three laws of robotics or a bottom up approach. And then I think I'll stop there because I have run over time. And I think that covers mainly yeah, the other points that I wanted to make. Thank you. <laughs>